Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Montpelier, my home in Orange County, Virginia, on Sunday, August the 1st. It's World Constitution Day, and I am very pleased to have you all with me today. Hello, everyone. So it's wonderful to be here tonight. For those of you who don't know, um, I am Mrs. Q, and I would like to give a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for World Constitution Day. And I hope you enjoy our talk tonight and you learn all about um, the creation of the United States Constitution. Now I would like to introduce to you my very good friend, uh, Mr. James Madison. And Mr. Madison, would you please, for those who for whatever reason may not know who you are, I cannot believe that's possible, but I suppose it is. Um, would you like to tell everyone who you are? Well, I'm James Madison Jr. That'll change it a bit, a little bit. My father was James Madison Sr. And uh, I am here to uh, entertain everyone here tonight at our plantation. And I am uh, a congressman. <laughs> and currently under our administration with uh, John Adams as our president of the United States, I'm here in Mount Pelier kind of monitoring the situation, Jefferson and I. And by the way, if you haven't visited Jefferson, uh, his door is always open as well. He's only a day's ride south of here. And uh, Mrs. Madison and I take a travel trip uh, regularly every summer to see him. He even has a room dedicated just for us. And <clears throat> while I have uh, served during George Washington's administration as a congressman, uh, I am not active in the federal government at this very moment, and neither is Mr. Jefferson. So uh, it gives me time to uh, entertain, which Mrs. Madison is very happy to do. Mr. Madison, would you uh, tell us a little bit about what you did in the Revolutionary War? Oh, well, I was quite young then. We're talking about the year 17 and 76. I was born in 17 and 51. That only makes me oh, 25 years old if I do my arithmetic correctly. And I was serving in Virginia level state government at the time. I had served under both the uh, governors, Patrick Henry and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And after the war, you became a delegate to what we now call the Constitutional Convention as it became clear to some gentlemen that the government under our Articles of Confederation was not going to be sufficient going forward. And how did you become a delegate? Was that something you actively sought to do or were you volunteered by others or how did you come to uh, attend that? Well, Mrs. Q, you ought to know by now that any good gentleman does not seek an electioneering appearance. As the good Roman Cincinnatus, you come to duty when you are called, but then you return to the plow. Now, I was elected as a, a delegate. I had prepared for the, the convention, as we call it, the delegates convention, for probably a full two to three years. And we were already questioning uh, Articles of Confederation in 17 and 84. And by 17 and 86, uh, we had decided to move on and try and improve them, but that's getting a little ahead of the, of the story, I think. I, I, I have heard rumors that you arrived at that convention uh, a number of days early, more than a week early, in order to affect your plan that you had for, shall we say, directing that convention. And, and I, I would also like to admit, um, I would like to add on your comment that a gentleman never seeks office. Well, of course that's true, but me being from the city of New York, as you know, our gentlemen often feign to not be seeking office when they are very much behind the scenes seeking office. <laughs> Although I know that to a gentleman like you from Virginia, that might seem a bit um, um, aggressive, but that is our way in New York. So is it true that you arrived early and that you already had a plan in hand for how you thought this, this meeting ought to go forward? Well, the answer is, uh, might be predictably, yes, because ever since a young boy, I was always been prompt. In fact, uh, His Excellency General George Washington, our first president, was always a man in favor of promptness as well. And yes, the convention was 
supposed to start, I believe, on May the 14th, but it did not come underway until about May the 25th, and arriving there on May the 3rd, uh, to no pop and circumstance, <laughs> and General Washington arriving there on May the 10th to much pomp and circumstance, and uh, the rest of the delegates drifting in uh, to make them all come in and arrive early. It allowed us to strategize at our boarding house, which became a very good advantage because for since 1786 in the spring, as I recall, I had written uh, my most copious notes, shall we say, entitled very uncreatively, Notes on Ancient and Modern Confederacies, where I used books that Jefferson had sent over from France. Don't forget, now, Jefferson wasn't even in the country at the time. He was our delegate minister over in France. And uh, that's where all the bibliophiles are over. There. He collected so many good and valuable books for me to put this together that you already alluded to. And by April, uh, just before I left for uh, Philadelphia, I had some finishing touches on some conclusions that I had, which was a list of vices of the current political system, of course, referring to the Articles of Confederation. So yes, I had come ready. And as uh, we chatted uh, over dinner and lunch at the boarding house, we uh, discovered that his Excellency, who was going to preside over that convention as the president, was in favor of the plan. And our strategy was to start with it right away. The first day that we reached, reached quorum, which was May the 25th, and our governor, Edmund Randolph, had the, uh, I don't know, I shouldn't say that, he had, he had the, the chore, I should say, for uh, elucidating all of those points that Virginia presented in its plan. It took almost the entire day to set the precedent that I may be seeing ahead in your questioning a bit, but uh, there was not everyone was there ready to do anything but revise the Articles of Confederation because that is what we were tasked to do. No one had permission, quite frankly, to do anything but that. And our intention was very much to do that very thing was explaining to our guests tonight that when you arrived at the um, what we what in the future they will call the Constitutional Convention, you did not have permission to create an entirely new document, but to fix the Articles of Confederation, and that one of the allies you found in writing an entirely new document um, was someone from New York, um, someone you may have found to be a surprising ally on that point. And would you like to talk a little bit about him and whether or not his alliance surprised you and how you went about convincing the others that that was the best path to take? You're referring to Mr. Hamilton. I am. Uh, well, we had so many influential New Yorkers at the convention and I, uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Hamilton uh, did not actually speak very much. I, Mind you. Well, that is a shocking you. thing to hear that Mr. Hamilton didn't speak very much. <laughs> well, when he decided to speak, he spoke for hours, but otherwise he was silent on the matter. You see, he had many other things to take care of, not, you know, none more important than his family. And he was still a, a lawyer in New York. And so he did not attend the entire three and a half months of the convention. He left on July, in July, after the other two delegates did which left him powerless because the other two delegates, uh, John Lansing and Robert Yates, uh, were clearly uh, Governor Clinton's, well, I don't know how I should call them, that they were of the same mindset that Governor I, Clinton- I might be a little bit more direct in saying that <laughs> Judge Lansing and Judge Yates were indeed the friends of Governor Clinton and could have been seen as his tools at that meeting. And of course, Governor Clinton was against a new constitution. And so Judge Yates and Judge Lansing, of course, expressed the Clintonian view as they were wont to do on many things. Mrs. Q, I know I can always count on you to be direct. <laughs> uh, 
so yes, thank you for filling in the blanks so that I did not have to claim those, uh, those answers myself. But really what Mr. Hamilton and I got more friendly with each other was the year prior at the Annapolis Convention. That's when we met at Man's Tavern in Annapolis in order to talk about the improvement of the country under the Articles of Confederation. And it was only a partial success because, <clears throat> excuse me, five, only five of the delegations showed up. And so we were unable to complete anything truly effective except to lobby Congress to allow us to reconvene in Philadelphia the following year, which of course happened when uh, we, we cajoled, shall we say, His Excellency to preside over the convention. Mr. Hamilton had a direct hand in that, and so did I, by physically visiting the general and telling him, quite frankly, to his face, almost as Mrs. Q would, that if he did not come to Philadelphia, others would not follow. But at that uh, Annapolis convention, it was when Mr. Hamilton and I grew closer in realizing that we had to find a way to strengthen a centralized government and not make it a singular legislative body that was crippled and hampered to complete ineffectiveness. We got through the war with it, but don't remember it, it was ratified in 1781 in the late war. It was proposed in 1777, but it was not officially in effect until 1781. And we were still fighting in the Southern campaign at the time for our independence from Great Britain. Well, what were some of the things that you felt the Articles of Confederation were not adequate for that the Constitution provides a better framework to, to manage? So what were some of the specific things you wanted to change? I think to keep it most general and most impactful would be a majority vote required to um, pass legislation. And excuse me, although there was no way to effectually enforce any legislation that was passed. And the other was a unanimous vote to override anything. And you know how difficult it is to get a unanimous vote on anything. So it just, it, would, it, it hogtied itself to a point of complete, it came to a screeching halt is what, it, what happened. So those are the two most glaring deficiencies of the articles. The other is that the constitution you had implied, how was it better? Well, we had figured out three different branches of government to uh, put our country together. And the executive would be the centralizing force, which at the time, well, that's going to get a little confusing, but at the time, uh, the nationalizing force under a strong executive is what Mr. Hamilton and I were both for, the legislative body to make the laws and the judicial grants to uh, enforce them and to determine whether they were constitutional or not. So those, the broad spectrum of how the articles were completely ineffective and how the constitution was going to be much more effective. Well, your ideas were quite, not to sound like as if I'm punning on this, but they were quite revolutionary, weren't they? Um, the idea of a chief executive who was not a monarch, although I have heard that Mr. Hamilton wanted the chief executive to serve during pleasure, which is often another way to say for life, <laughs> although he later claimed he didn't mean that, um, but a, a quite novel idea that a chief executive ought to be selected and have to be reelected after a certain term of time. And of course, a brilliant idea for making sure that the states were on one account equally represented in one body being our Senate, um, with each state having two votes in the Senate. So um, little tiny Rhode Island would have the same um, power as large Virginia or New York and an apportioned representation in the House of Representatives where the states would be represented by population. And uh, a, a truly revolutionary idea, maybe, maybe having some roots in the old House of Commons and House of Lords, but of course the Senate does not serve for life as the Lords would, but kind of an idea of an upper house um, that would have a more thoughtful or sedate approach to things. I, I know that's, <laughs> I'm saying that in the, 
So I say the most generous terminology that they would have a, a thoughtful and sedate approach versus a House of Representatives that may be a little more rambunctious in, in the way they operate. Um, truly a brilliant idea. And a Supreme Court, in order to decide conflicts between those branches of government and your idea that those branches of government ought to be rivals with each other and struggling with each other for power in order to not any of them have too much power. And one of my favorite quotes of yours from the Federalist Papers is that if men were angels, we wouldn't need governments and that we know government is a necessary evil and that the worst people are drawn to it. Therefore, we have tried to create a government with checks and balances to put a limitation on the potential corruption. Um, I, I think your writings on those subjects are brilliant, sir. Oh, this is you. You're trying to flatter me, are you? Of, of course. Of course. That's something you do in the French court, madam. I think maybe you need another glass of wine. <laughs> Yours is empty, I, I assume. Do you, can I pour you another glass of Madeira? Certainly. Certainly. People who watch me every week know I always have my glass of wine. Thank you, sir. Oh, I am not a fan of the spiritist liquors, but I do enjoy a glass of wine with dinner and the champagnes also. Well, I do want to, because we are speaking to some people that are more interested in the finer points of the Constitution than the others, the, the branches of government are not there to rival each other. And I know you didn't mean that literally, but I just didn't want to, anyone to misunderstand that the branches of government there are to make sure that the people remain in power and that the checks and balances uh, allow the government to function in a way such that <clears throat> the people are served most adequately. While you were all there in Philadelphia that summer, I wonder if you would be willing to share some of your personal feelings of what was going on. Was it the sort of experience where you went home every night feeling encouraged and exhilarated or feeling overwhelmed and a bit depressed at the intransigence of some of the members? Or was it perhaps a little bit of both while you were there? Well, to be perfectly honest, I think it was more exhausting. And one of the reasons for me personally was because I took it upon myself to take notes on a daily basis. And uh, I didn't miss a single session nor any portion of any session. So I could not have missed a single speech unless it was a very short one. And that was probably because I had to go to the necessary. Well, you know, sir, I was just reading a letter written recently from Mr. Congressman Governor Morris here in New York to Mr. Edward Livingston as there, as you know, is always debate going on about what you meant when you all wrote the constitution and what various various passages meant. And Mr. Morris, I thought, said something quite brilliant. He said, of course, none of us actually remember what we said that summer as, as it is so many years ago. And the men who claim to remember what they said or what someone else said, surely are remembering what they wish was said. And he said, and I'm going to be honest here and admit I don't remember what I said, but if anyone wants to know why they should write to Madison, who was the only one in the room taking notes. I, and I love that observance that he made that all of the others were making things up and that he was going to be honest and say he had no idea, but that they should simply consult you. Well, the pen was very active in my hand. I went through very a number of quills, shall we say, and it didn't stop during the active portion of the session for the very reason that you imply, not to forget what was said on the floor. Now, I wrote, was writing as fast as I could, and I had even developed a shorthand in my head such that I could write things down faster and decode them after I had gone back to the boarding house. So my day did not end. Many of the delegates went over to Franklin Court and had glasses of Madeira and other liquor 
and uh, Spiritus Liquors to uh, continue the lobbying efforts that went on in between the sessions. But for me, I remember my boarding house hostess, Mrs. Eliza Trist, uh, Mrs. House's daughter was very concerned about my health because all I did was work to the bone all the time. So quite frankly, I was exhausted. So once, once you all came together and wrote this historic document, and it was time for the ratification of the document, you now faced a whole other type of opposition in questions from the various states over what different things meant, and particularly from our two states, New York and Virginia, many questions. And you sat down with two esteemed New Yorkers, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Jay, and you all addressed these in papers that in the future will be called the Federalist Papers. And even after that, they were reluctant to ratify the Constitution. And they sent you a whole list of changes they required. Would you like to tell everyone how many changes were submitted and how you winnowed them down to the ones that were ultimately presented? I think people would be surprised. Well, how does 200 sound? <laughs> 200? Doubtless 180 from New York. I, I, I kid. <laughs> there was very many from New York and many were conditional. They stated, you know, if we did not Im uh, implement the amendments that were suggested, they would not ratify the Constitution. The, the process that I went through was... A, log a logical one, I thought. First, I purged the ones that would have structurally altered it, the Constitution itself. Those I set aside right away. So that winnowed them down to the first uh, portion. And then we went on and I began looking for commonalities in words. We had, uh, as I said, I had studied for months uh, based on Jefferson's books to put down on paper those clues that I received from ancient and modern confederacies. And those certain words kept repeating themselves, like life, liberty, property, happiness, and safety. And remind me later, Mrs. Q, to uh, define property, if you would, because it might not be exactly what everyone thinks. Uh, and so those commonalities came up repeatedly. And the most common uh, affect that we had was a lack of individualized rights. And so Jefferson himself said that every country, any, every just government on earth should have a, a list of individualized rights. And I was originally against it to keep the Constitution simpler and to also say that if the, if the Constitution is silent on a subject, that means that it cannot be done. But I began to become convinced that the other was to be done because of the rampant, as you say, uh, vilification of the Constitution as it stood. There were so many people in New York that were, as we called them, anti-federalist, which would be states' rights people. And so by the time I had winnowed them down, I came to 19, which is what I presented. When they went to the Senate, it came down to 12. And then when they went to the ratification process in the states, we got our 10 Bill of Rights. Yes, and I notice, and I don't know how many people joining us tonight have noticed this, but they seem very similar to the section of Mr. Jefferson's wonderful Declaration of Independence that lists the crimes committed against the colonies by King George III. And that many of those things in those first 10 amendments are similar or I would say, are there to prevent someone from doing the things that King George did? Arguably, the, the most important of the amendments is the First Amendment that protects so many of the individualized rights, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble, freedom to uh, petition the government, and perhaps my favorite, freedom of religion. And so those were not completely unique. There is much precedent 
to have been studied. And much of it comes from a man named John Locke. John Locke wrote two treatises on government around 1689, a whole century prior to our first federal Congress in your fine city of New York. And uh, the other one is a, a, a treatise on human understanding. And that was a secular view of some of the biblical principles that uh, set people's rights to be natural. And they were God-given rights such that no government could impose upon them. And those rights of speech and property and those types of liberties are natural born rights and not subject to government intervention. Very good. And I, I think you, you know that New York was the first colony to have the right to the free press with our trial of John Peter Zenger in 1735. New York also had a couple of legal precedents allowing free practice of religion. So when it came to those, and of course, you New, York, New Yorkers always arguing and protesting about everything. Of course, you know, the New York delegation would want those to be specifically protected as well as the right to not be searched without um, a warrant, um, not to be witness against yourself. You know, all of the kinds of, we might call it hanky-panky we saw going on um, with the King's troops here um, in the decade before, of course, our Revolutionary War began, all of the things they were doing to us, which were even against our rights as British subjects under the common law itself, but still us being abused against our own rights. And of course, we would want those all to be listed out specifically um, so that the new federal government could not interfere in those rights. Um, so do you think that government although government should not interfere in those rights, that government in some way has a role in protecting those rights as well? I would say yes, Mrs. Q. What are the first three words of the preamble to the Constitution? And those are? We the people. We the people, of course. We the people, the government serves the people. Uh, so the government takes responsibility to preserve those rights, very simply. I see, so that it, again is somewhat of an extension of Mr. Jefferson's words, which came out of Virginia, that governments are instituted deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. A, a shocking repudiation of the divine right of kings at the time, a very stunning thing. And of course, to be continued in our constitution. Yes, indeed. Uh, and the Federalist essays also addressed some of those issues. I said something on the order of that in the first uh, order that the government has to learn how to control itself and in the next place, uh, uh, oblige it to control the people. So it is almost uh, seemingly a contradiction in terms, but that's what makes our constitution so great. No, we do have it a part. I'm sorry, it's part national, and it's part federal. Exactly, and unique, and, and unique in that division. And unique in that division, yes. And before I forget, I just wanted to mention that uh, differentiation I wanted to make about property. Yes, please do. That's a, that's a Lockean principle that says that your own person is your property, and it is not to be imposed upon. And if your person does something productive, let's say you're a farmer, a very common trade here in the States, that you produce a crop of wheat and that wheat is going to be of value to other uh, persons, you sell that wheat and the monetary compensation you have for that allows you to gain the more landed property that some of you might have thought the original derivation of the word meant. But in this particular case, it really harkens back to your own person. Uh, but it then becomes the property that we know of because you are doing work of value. A very, a very important concept to us here in America, um, property rights. Yes, ma'am. Indeed. And, and in part the cause for our war with England's dispute over property rights. Yes, 
you are such a learned lady. Thank Mrs. You, Madison. Sir. Mrs. Madison adores you, Mrs. Q, and that's why that we uh, have become great friends with. I have to admit that when I was in the th in my 30s, I I was rather uh, uh, poor in my social skills. I have been shy and and reserved. You know, one of the reasons I've never gone into the ministry. I went to a theological seminary in Princeton, uh, the College of New Jersey. I do not have a loud speaking voice. Please, if anyone is having trouble hearing what I have to say now that we're halfway through our, our program here, put, put a note, notation and I will try to speak up louder. But no, I was very unsure of myself in my earlier years. And I think Mrs. Madison helped bring me uh, out of my shell. And I, of course, am much older now and more experienced. And when I'm in my home of Montpelier here in my my comfortable parlor with guests that I enjoy, such as yourself and the others that have joined us tonight. I do tend to come out of my shell. I do have a sense of humor, although it is a bit dry. I do love a good pun. I do love a good wit. And sometimes I like to listen more than I like to speak. A sign of great intellect. Uh, I do have some comments and questions for you, sir. All right. Mrs. Felder says that she is enjoying this very much and she hopes you become president one day. What Indeed. do you think of that? I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing we have to do is get Adams out of office. That's the first thing. That we have oh, to my do. goodness. Oh, well, we'll get into this another time. But I, I, I hear that the Federalist plotters in New York um, are hard at work at that. <laughs> removing Adams from office. <laughs> but we won't discuss that here tonight. We also have Mr. Jensen would like to know how, when you're in Virginia, you communicate with the government in Philadelphia. Oh, just like anyone else, you put your post in on the next stage. It's so difficult to get a letter. I had to wait sometimes up to six weeks to get a letter from Jefferson from France. There is no quick way. <laughs> there isn't. And it depends on the weather. You were lucky in arriving here when the weather was nice. We either have a, a canal with deep gorges to have to cross if it's raining or it's so dusty that it becomes an insect infested, uh, malaria carrying, horrible mess. Uh, the roads are absolutely horrible. You have to give the carriage drivers due credit. They do a wonderful job to avoid calumny and calamity. Well, maybe that lack of uh, timely communication might help impede some of the bad intentions some may have in the government. My own father always believed that the less the government was able to do, the better off we all were. <laughs> this is my, some wisdom from my father. Now we have another question here. Um, what made you get into politics? How did that come about? Well, I prefer to call it statesmanship if possible. Of course. <laughs> a good gentleman from Virginia would rather call himself a statesman than a politician. A politician has such a, a bad uh, aftertaste to it. But in New York, they are politicians. In Virginia, you are statesmen. <laughs> that's what I'd like to say. I'm sure that's what Mr. Henry would have liked to have said, too. But uh, we'll get into that subject later as well, if you'd like. That requires two more glasses of Madeira, however. <laughs> What got me into politics? A lot of reflection. I do a lot of reflection anyway. It's always been a, a habit of mine. I think it's just born in me. When someone of my luck, uh, who has a father who was able to care for his oldest son and for as long as he did, I uh, was able to go to university. And being in a, th a theological school, and being of a professional mindset and having a mind that is probably my only muscle, I decided that I wouldn't go into the ministry, that I would not practice law, which might be surprising to some of you, but I somehow wanted to gather very large concepts in my brain to have to do with world government. And so all those books, which, of which there were not only 200 amendments to work through, but about 200 books that Jefferson sent to me, I poured through those books like they were water. And the, I just have to say, I had nothing but an inborn desire 
that I discovered to work for the greater good of people. And I was a fervent patriot as, as a young 25 year old, but I didn't have the physical skills to actually fight. I had to use my brain instead of my brawn. And uh, that's simply the, the best answer I can give you. I was drawn to it from birth and just didn't know it at the time. You were, you were um, let's say, circumstances benefited you and that the right circumstances came about to serve your needs and for you to serve the needs of your new nation. I have a very interesting question for you here. We may want to get Mrs. Madison to join us for this one. This question oh. is, would you ever envision the constitution giving women the right to vote? And has Mrs. Madison ever discussed that with you? Should we ever give the, the uh, women a chance to vote? I don't believe that's ever come up in any kind of discussion or dialogue in any position I've held in public service yet. Now that is a point, you know, if you are a friend of mine and Mrs. Madison is my wife, that I do, I remember saying something on the order about the capacity of the female mind for studies of the highest order cannot be doubted, having sufficiently been demonstrated by works of science, of erudition, of literature, and other things. But at this time, no, I don't see a future for women to vote, not to say that the world might not change, but currently I would say no. And have I spoken to Mrs. Madison about that specific issue? No. It's not something that most of the ladies of our time have really considered, although you probably do know that Mrs. Adams did suggest to Mr. Adams that the ladies play a part in the future in choosing the government. And, and Mr. Adams you know, brushed her off and um, caused her to be a, a bit angry at him for some amount of time. <laughs> so we'll leave, that, um, we'll leave that to the Adams. I can say that in our family, this is something we have not discussed either as Mr. Q does vote for both of us. And of course, Mr. Q and I are of the same mind on, on most things. And it just seems normal for us to have one vote for our family. And I think that's the way most people of our time view this. Um, so we have another question for you. Mr. Madison, did you support a robust government with almost unlimited power? That sounds like a question for Mr. Hamilton, but did you support a robust government with almost unlimited power? Well, it sounds like a loaded question to me. <laughs> no, I did not. The uh, Originally, because of the lack of the effectiveness of the Articles of Confederation, Mr. Hamilton and I agreed on the national government, the executive branch, to hold more power, but unlimited? Never. And, and I, I must say, sir, that they... Thank you for your candidness, as we know that Mr. Hamilton professed some things and then worked to make them a bit different from what he originally professed. But I suppose that is just a bit of a disease we have in, in New York, uh, making us such a unique and difficult um, state to work with. I'm, I'm sure you know that the Federalists and Anti-Federalists in New York were you know, quite, shall we say, determined to defeat each other and it was a miracle that Mr. Hamilton in our New York Constitutional Convention got them to agree on ratification. And were you surprised when you got the news that Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Jay were ultimately successful at the New York Ratification Convention? I'm more than surprised, I was relieved and pleased because I do know the facts that you are telling me. There was, to my knowledge, and you can correct me if this is not true, Mrs. Q, but there are only a few and perhaps four to count them, small pockets, mostly in the, uh, the urban areas of your city that were Federalist in nature. Most of the larger part of the landmass of New York State was in favor of Governor Clinton's anti-Federalist uh, stance. And the numbers played out something in the order of 17 uh, in the Federalist camp and 46 in the anti-Federalist camp in Poughkeepsie. So barring the fact that 
there was some dissension within the anti-federalist ranks. Otherwise, it was practically magic that uh, Mr. Hamilton performed. He did turn it around. And the Federalist essays written specifically for New Yorkers originally, uh, knowing the factors that you describe about your candid city, is that uh, we knew that we had a very hard road to tow and we were monitoring each other, our states, because each of us claimed to be the most powerful. You can't find a more anti fervent anti-federalist than our own Patrick Henry. Uh, so he never came to the convention. He was not a part of our delegation or our contingent. He said he smelled a rat and then argued completely against the ratification. I had to study and, and actually made up tenets to follow in order to debate someone with such charisma in order. And here's one thing that I could say about the men of the times, even though I know this is a bit of a tangent, but it's a good point to make that the convention that wrote the constitution and the ratifying conventions, which were arguably more decisive or divisive rather than the uh, delegates convention itself, still the men were knowledgeable and intelligent enough to realize that compromise was necessary. And that uh, in order for us to get a constitution at all, we had to give up some things in favor of others. And I think that's why everyone went to Franklin Court to have some Madeira after <laughs> the convention was over because they aligned with this and they would trade for this to, in order to get that. And so in fact, when that document finally came out, it might be a surprise for many of you to hear that I was quite disheartened with the whole thing. Three out of four of the proponent of the factors that I thought were the most important were outvoted. So I have to share all kinds of credit with all of my colleagues for producing a document that ultimately I said about the men who arrived there and stayed the course through those three and a half months, you're, you're waving a fan. Well, we had weather like that in Philadelphia for the three and a half months that we were behind closed doors in secret. Uh, but I'll tell you, there were never of New York will be. There were never an assembly of men charged with a great and arduous trust who were more pure in their motives, or more exclusively or anxiously devoted to the object committed to them than the delegates at the federal convention. Well, I so, have to yes. mention that the ladies of New York would be so jealous at the wonderful frizz caused by your humid, hot weather here, because <laughs> the ladies work very hard to get their hair and a giant ball of frizz like this. And I have had no trouble doing it since I've been visiting you here. So there's one good thing about the weather. We have a couple of more questions for you. Um, what leisure activities do you enjoy when you're not being a statesman? What do you like to do here at, at, at Montpelier when you're not working? Well, you see a chessboard there behind you. I do enjoy a game of chess. Uh, I, I do enjoy my morning rides around the plantation. From very early on, some of you might not, well, probably some of more of you know than don't know that I've been rather sickly over the course of my life. And so the doctors and my father and my friends have always encouraged me for some physical exertion. And I do enjoy horseback riding. Uh, especially to uh, take my measurements for the weather and such. Uh, and uh, I enjoy reading, even if I'm not working, I'm still reading. Uh, I enjoy sleeping because I tend to work so hard that I enjoy sleeping, that I consider a recreational activity. And a uh, good glass of Madeira. And it's really not much else that... Uh, I'll, except the company of Mrs. Madison. And I was going to say, the company so. of Mrs. Madison, I'm sure is very satisfying. And we, and we have another question. How did you get chosen to write the constitution? Were you chosen? Did you volunteer? Were you volunteered by someone else? Uh, no, I wasn't chosen to write the constitution. And uh, I was hoping to have made that point clear. I don't mean to embarrass the, the, the person that asked the question, but uh, Unlike the goddess of wisdom, <laughs> it was the work of many heads and many hands. So it was a collaborative effort. I will say that 
some people remarked that I had come to the convention most prepared. That might be true. Uh, the evidence is that the Virginia's uh, plan it had no official name, but our plan was arguably the template off of which the final document was created. But as I just mentioned very candidly, three out of the four things that I thought were most important were I was outvoted on. So um, I can't reveal the particulars of what went on inside those closed doors in secrecy. Uh, we might want to say a few words why something like that that would seem so anti-Republican to be uh, so important at the time, but um, it had to be it had to be that compromise. And we do have another question. If there was one thing you could change in the Constitution looking back, what would it be or would it be anything? Oh, I have an answer for that. It would be the national veto. I was, in, Jefferson was against it. Of course I was outvoted for it, but out of the ones that I mentioned, uh, the national veto is the one that I will expressly name. Very interesting. And, and, and why, why, why would, do you think that is so important? Well, the states have their own constitutions and then we had a national constitution. And through my studies, they've all been simply parchment barriers. Just because you have a written constitution doesn't mean it's followed. And corruption- no, I would never, I would never believe such a thing could happen. Never. <laughs> here, 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 here. Everyone's, everyone's bouncing their canes on the floor, including Dr. Franklin. I can hear it now. <laughs> Even I'll ask, I'll, I'll act a little embarrassed, although I never really get embarrassed. Although I did get embarrassed a couple of weeks ago when we were discussing the lewd women of New York. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Mrs. Q, don't get your fan communication mixed up. Let's not let's not have that uh, improperly, you know, in some kind of code that's misunderstood. Now we know why. On some of these evenings, Mr. Q makes me meet with everyone in the basement kitchen, away from where <laughs> anyone can hear what I'm talking about. Well, I, I don't know. Perhaps you were active in committee of safety meetings, and we're not even aware of it. <laughs> Oh, someone asked, someone would like to know, one of the ladies would like to know if you have any children. And if yeah. so, what, um, what are their professions? Are, are they following in your footsteps or what is happening in the Madison family? Well, the Madison family consists of my stepson, John Payne Todd. Uh, Mrs. Madison, unfortunately, lost her infant son during the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 in Philadelphia. She was a Quaker at the time and married to an upstanding and upcoming lawyer. But uh, John Payne, uh, although a, a smart lad, is an adult now and he is traveling the country and we never know when he's going to return. We never know what, when something's gonna be missing from the house. The poor lad is a wayward son. And we both have tried to help him as, as best we can uh, somewhat to protect the other. We find that, you know, Mrs. Madison finds that I've been giving him money. And then I find out that Mrs. Madison has been giving him money. The poor lad is just intelligent. I've given him positions. I've given him responsibilities, but uh, he seems to squander them all the time. Uh, there's, Mrs. Madison is, is somewhat in denial, I must admit, because we do not have a child together. So she is the only one that uh, she, or he is the only one that she puts her heart and soul into. That is understandable. So we do our best. Now, I, I think you know that Mr. Q has been known to be a bit of a time traveler himself and that he is known by a number of other names throughout time. And what would you think if I told you that people watching in the future refer to you as the father of the United States Constitution. Well, I would blush. Mrs. Q, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do that to little Jemmy Madison, would you? Well, well, but it's true. They will remember you as the father of the United States Constitution, and you will be the single name most closely associated with it in the future. I don't know what to say. I'm speechless. Well, let's have a toast. Let's have a toast 
to all of the documents that led to the United States Constitution? Yes, let's do. And to the Constitution itself. Uh, do any of you have any more questions tonight for Mr. Madison? If not, I think we can conclude our visit and thank all of you so much for joining us tonight and giving us this opportunity to talk about the Constitution. Any, any late questions? I don't see any. No? Mrs. Q, do we have any more time? Well, we have been together for an hour, sir. All right, I see. Well, then I'll just make a brief statement if you don't mind. Please do. Remember, citizens, that this Constitution was never a foregone conclusion from any of my colleagues. So please prevent apathy and prevent ignorance and continue to pass on the tenets that this Constitution employs such that we may have a country in the future that someone could be named the father of the Constitution for. We have many people thanking you for joining us tonight.